You now have a first idea on how a relational database works, so it is time for us to take a look at the database that we will use in this course. So let's return to ColdFusion Builder. And this time we will turn our attention to the RDS panel, situated on the right-hand side of the screen. RDS stands for Remote Development Services. It is a way to access some resources of the ColdFusion Administrator remotely, without having to actually log on to the ColdFusion Administrator. RDS must be activated only on development environments. On production ColdFusion servers, RDS must be deactivated for obvious security reasons. But here in our development installation, RDS is enabled and gives us the ability to see our databases right from within ColdFusion Builder. So I will open here the default local server, which is the only ColdFusion server that I have defined in ColdFusion Builder. And when I do that, I have a list of all the data sources defined in that server. So I will use the HD Street final data source here. And when I open that data source, I can see the different object types that I have defined in that data source. And among them is some tables. Now here I have seven tables here in this database. So when I open, for example, the users table, I can see the different fields defined in that table. So let's open the panel to have a better view that way. Now the first field of the users table is the user ID. So that's the name of the field. Then you have here integer, which is the type of data. It means that this field contains a number, a non-decimal number. 10 is the maximum length of the data, so it's an integer of maximum 10 numbers, 10 characters. And also the fact that this is a required piece of information, so when defining a user, you must provide a user ID. Actually, this field is generated automatically by the database, so we don't have to worry about it. Now, the second field here is the user first name, so that's the name of the field. Varkar is the type of data, it's another way of saying string, and 125 is the maximum length of that piece of data, so it's a string of maximum 125 characters, which is more than enough for first names, of course. Now, if I right-click on the table here, I can also show table contents. And when I do that, I see the records that are defined in that particular table of the database. So in the users table, I have two users. I have Joe Admin and I have Celine. And I have all the fields for all the users. They have the first name, the last name, the, their password, email address, and so on. Now here, the user approved, it's a small int. It's a required piece of information as well. Now in my case, it has to be zero or one. Zero, the user is not approved. One, the user is approved. So this is a flag, if you will, a yes-no value, a true-false. Same thing for the user is active. So here, zero, the user is not active, and one, the user is active. Now, the last two fields here, the role and the instrument, those are foreign keys. It means that they establish a relationship with data stored in another table. So let's take a look at the roles table. The roles table only contains two fields, and if I show the content, you see that we have defined two roles. Role number one is user and role number two is administrator. So if I go back to my users table, you see that both users here have the role number two, which corresponds to administrators. We have defined two administrators. For the instruments, if I go back to my RDS panel, for the instruments, I also have only two fields, the instrument ID and the name. And when I right click and show table contents, I have here the list of instruments with the corresponding number. So here the FLD instrument ID, that's the name of the field. It's a required piece of data and that's the primary key. So each number must be different. But again, remember that in the users table, if two users play the same instrument, I will have twice the same number here, which is allowed because this is a foreign key and not a primary key. Now, we have some more tables. For example, here the pages table contains here, you see a bunch of fields. If I right click and show that content, the content of that table, you see that we have six pages defined here. They all have their unique ID number. We have the title of the page. Now we have here the author of the page, and that is a foreign key 
to the users table. So here, it's user number one that have created those pages. And user number one, remember, refers to Joe Admin. So that is the first administrator of the site. So let's go back to the pages table because there are some more things to say. Now here I have the page creation date. And here you see that the page creation date is a timestamp. And it's also a required piece of information. A timestamp, you see, it's a way of storing a date and a time in a normalized way, in a, in a normalized fashion, so that databases can understand that. Also here, the modifier, so who has modified the page? The last modification was made by user one, once again, which is the foreign key to the user's table. At what date the page has been modified? The, the last modification of those pages has been performed on this date here. And this field is a timestamp as well. Now, an interesting field here is the page content. You see that it contains an HTML snippet. And if you place the mouse over that snippet, you will see the full length of this field. You see that there are a lot of HTML tags here. Now, this field is a long var car. You see, it's a long string of text of maximum 32,700 characters. So that makes it possible to store in that field longer texts and eventually uh, entire blog posts or uh, page content. Now, the last thing I have here is the page is active, one or zero. Zero, the page is not active, and one, it is active. Now, we have a few more tables to go. The uh, news tables here, so if I show the content of that news table, you have a bunch of fields as well. You have the ID of the news, the title of the news, the author of the news, which is a foreign key to the users table, the news creation date, which is a timestamp as well, and the news content, which of course is a long var car. You can see that here in the uh, RDS panel. Now, if I look at the comments table, we also have a bunch of fields here in the comments table. We have, of course, the ID number, the unique ID number of the comment. And here we have a foreign key to the news table. So it's the news that comment relates to. So we have two comments for news number one and one comment here for news number three. Also the date of the news, which is a timestamp. The author of the news, so that is the data that the the visitor enters on the front end in, in the name field if the news has been approved or not. So by default, when the news is created, that field is at zero. The news is not approved. But then when the administrator goes to the administration section of the site and approves the, the comment, these fields become one. And here, of course, the comment, the, the content of the comment, which is as you might ex expect, a long var car as well. One more table is the events table, always the same kind of information. So you have the number of the event, the name of the event, the date of the event, which is a timestamp, the location and the venue. Those are regular uh, string of text var cars. You can see that here. The description of the event, which is a long var car. And here, the author of the event, which is a foreign key to the users table. You see that one event has been created by Celine and the other ones by uh, user number one, which is uh, which is uh, Joe Admin. And here, the event creation date, oops, which is the date the event has been entered in the database. So you now have a better idea of the database that we will work with, of the table that database contains, of the field contains in each table, and also of the relationships that unites those tables in this relational database.